Good afternoon. Welcome back after lunch. Um, the world of TV, or more strictly, digital video, is coming of age. So the pioneers, the Netflixes, the Amazon Primes, the global pioneers, are now no longer alone. There's a whole wave of new global entrants, Apple, Disney, Warner Media, and others. This afternoon, we'll be exploring what our regional pioneers are involved with in pushing ahead with the whole video streaming landscape, what it means and what the opportunities are. And we're very fortunate to be joined with Janice Lee, Managing Director of PCCW Media. Uh, PCCW Media started life as your more traditional IPTV platform, but it's evolved very rapidly over the last few years to have a regional video streaming service view, uh, video um, audio music streaming services. They have free-to-air broadcasters, and they produce a lot of content. So I'm delighted that you joined us today, Janice. Thank you. So Janice, you've been building up your customer base very aggressively over the last few years, um, and now streaming is the new normal. Um, how have you seen like consumption habits, you know, video consumption habits change, maybe in your home market of Hong Kong and around the region? I think, first of all, viewers are becoming very global in their habits. So um, whether it's Hong Kong or the rest of Southeast Asia or all the millennials in the US, all over the world, actually, their consumption behavior and habits are getting more and more similar. Um, but let's talk about the new normals. I mean, what are the new normals? Um, the new normals are binging. Right? So when we first started business, uh, IPTV business 15 years ago, that's not really the mode of consumption. But binging, it's definitely a new normal. The other new normal is um, watching anytime, anywhere. It is so cliche. I cringe when I say it. But we almost take it for granted. That's what we do now. right? Um, new normal does not really have a prime time. I think that is a thing of the past. I think most things are watched on demand, um, except for probably sports and news. Um, where I come from, obviously, recently we've seen consumption of live news, um, uh, uh, you know, increase three, four fold because of um, happenings in Hong Kong. But the mode of consumption of that live news is not about watching it before you go to work or at night, but it does really follow you throughout the day. Now, finally, I think the other. <coughs> thing which is very distinctive about offering a service now is the new normal as an oper I'm sorry as an operator um we have to adapt very quickly. Uh, speed is almost more important than anything else, and that includes uh, the new normal of global simulcast. I remember sitting on a stage probably at a different event probably four or five years ago and really pleading to our um, Hollywood studio partners that if we aren't able to simulcast a TV show or a movie um, uh, premiering in, on US television, you're going to see piracy eat away at everyone's business. So now, fast forward you know, four or five years, um, most of the shows are day and date. Uh, we simulcast together with the US, and that really closes the window on piracy. So that is definitely a very welcomed, I think, new normal for both viewers and as an operator. Mm. So you were a very early mover to move into the streaming space. I think a lot of people were seeing it coming, and, and you moved. You built up a subscriber base across the region. You've got quite an active user base as well. But we're seeing a wave of new entrants, not just the global players. We're seeing alternative services as well springing up that are maybe a different use of people's time. How are you continuing to differentiate your kind of streaming video off offering, and how are you going to keep that competitive advantage going? Mm. I think, first of all, uh, we started VIEW, which is our pan-regional video streaming business, about three, three and a bit years ago. So we started with a hypothesis that turned out to well, um, be our competitive edge. But again, with all internet businesses, the competitive edge is something that you have to continually build up because things um, you know, can be... Uh, copied, things um, can evolve, and the, and the landscape around you, in fact, evolves. So in man maintaining that edge, you constantly have to kind of revisit and be nimble and, and course correct. But looking back, um, gladly, I can say that we've done a lot more things right than we have wrong. And um, the things that we've had to learn from, we course corrected, like I said, fairly quickly. So what are the, some of the things that we started as a hypothesis and, and ended up being a good decision? Um, first of all, we decided um, that the go-to-market strategy has to be very 
relevant to our local market. It is not a global strategy. It's a very Asia-centric strategy because looking at the landscape, whether it's um, as far as on pricing or whether it's our decision to start with a dual revenue model, uh, which ended up being a great thing for us because um, it, it was important when we look at Southeast Asia, the markets are quite fragmented. The price points, uh, we basically price to the market anywhere from $1.99 to $4.99 US, depending on, on where, you know, which market we're in. But at that sort of pricing level um, and being part of a company that I have to report results on publicly every six months, we couldn't rely on just the build up of the export revenue. So we, we made a decision from get-go that digital advertising is going to be a significant part of our business. And for the view business now, subscription and advertising is pretty much 50-50 for us. Of course, some markets are more ad skewed, some are more subscription skewed. But if you fast forward um, to today, I think whether it's peers that have been around before us or new entrants that look like they're coming into Asia, I think everybody else has now said that they're going to have a freemium model with a free tier. Um, the other thing that we decided on is to go um, local. Local in the sense is being locally relevant. So we have pan-regional content that appeals across the region, but we um, localize it within a very fast four-hour window to, again, to close um, the, the gap on um, piracy. Uh, but at the same time, we uh, now produce in, uh, in actually more than eight markets. So we produce in Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Philippines, um, et cetera. And that helps us to round out our, our, our pan-regional proposition, but also at the same time um, to create content assets. Um, and we're seeing some of these content assets are beginning to travel beyond its own country of origin. Now, all of this has taken us um, about three years. We're right now at about 36 million monthly active users. Um, um, it's public, so our revenues crossed over 100 million in 2018 and, and growing uh, rapidly. Um, and, and all of this is to this day. Now, how do we continue to maintain that edge? The one thing that we have built up is to learn from that customer base, right? So while we started with our hypothesis, and as I said, we're very fortunate that we did more things right than we did wrong, but now we're making more informed decisions because we are actually looking at the three years of data um, and analyzing whether it's every show that we, we, we air, how it performs week by week versus other shows that we've carried before. Um, how do we acquire you know, users much more cost effectively? So everything that we do now in maintaining the competitive edge isn't just so hypothesis based, but we're validating this day, day to day. Mm. So you mentioned being locally relevant was a key part of that and, and to compete, your content strategy has been a key part of that. You were, I'd probably say the first of the regional streamers to push into local content. It was core to your proposition from the beginning. Um, how are you sourcing the production of the content? What, what, what are the, your, is your approach to finding that next wave and building the relationships with talent that will give you that competitive edge as, as, as everyone else tries to move into local content? Yeah, so I think in this new world, it it's all about partnership because we, first of all, our service exists to our users um, in the whole fabric of that OTT landscape, which isn't just about all the streamers. It's also about social media. It's also about um, other, you know, whether it's esports or other things that they do, right? So um, in, even in creating content, for example, we've integrated social media into our show. So we've done one of the shows actually out of Singapore here called No Sleep, No FOMO, which really integrates um, all of the, we, we casted both uh, pan-regional celebrities from Korea as well as local influencers from each of the market, Philippines, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, et cetera, so that we have the local reach um, that, you know, together these influencers have another 12 million following on top of our, you know, 30 million users. And we allow the users to then co-create segments for our show. So the production companies may not have liked it very much because they like to have everything planned, but we threw in a segment where we would reach out and have fans co-create and make decisions about how to you know, chart the course of the adventure with the celebrity. So that is uh, the kind of partnership that we see and how do we integrate uh, with the rest of the uh, OTT landscape. And in sourcing um, these ideas, so this particular one, um, No Sleep, No FOMO, is a format, a story lab format. 
We, we do <clears throat> produce a mix of format shows as well as uh, develop original IPs. We've done things such as work with other international <clears throat> In global companies, we've done um, The Bridge, which is an animal format. So we're now in season two of The Bridge. And um, our broadcast partner is actually HBO. So again, it's about you know finding the partnership upstream as well as downstream that we work with to expand the distribution of that content because we're all about how do you monetize the content as well as you know grow the platform at the same time. Um, other shows uh, and IPs include, you know, working with Warner Brothers. We've just announced uh, we're doing uh, Pretty Little Liars um, in um, in Asia, in Indonesia, and Malaysia, um, and. Um, in terms of original format, in Thailand, I just came from uh, um, Bangkok, uh, we're doing a show called uh, Bubble Tea, uh, which again, uh, will have pan-regional appeal because we're seeing Thai, uh, so there's the K-wave, but we're seeing you know, a development of uh, uh, Thai content getting popularity from what we can see um, on our platform that crosses the markets. Well, bubble tea is certainly popular here in Singapore as yes. well. <laughs> yes. the, um, so we've seen a lot of people going, uh, coming up with this originals concept to help define the platform. Do you see that becoming part of your content strategy too? You're exploring various different partnerships, but is this the sort of uh, view originals? Is this part of the strategy of stamping your identity? Yes, absolutely. So again, in, in I think creating and owning um, content assets is really important. So while you know we started working with really great partners in Korea to bring a lot of that you know, very popular content um, to Southeast Asia. We work with also um, uh, companies in Japan to bring Japanese content and Chinese content. And of course, we produce uh, Chinese content from Hong Kong as well that we distribute um, around the region. But in, in order to create enough content, I think it's got to be an effort that is both working with these existing IPs and developing um, the local adaptation, but sometimes we use the backbone and it has to be quite localized versus a balance of original IP just to get enough volume going. Because this year, right now, up to now, we have uh, 50 titles in 2019 that's either been released or in development uh, or, or in production, and then there's more that's in development. Now, in order to get to that meaningful volume, we have to find and continue to work with more partners. Mm. And is, did I read that you're part, uh, partnering with a digital storytelling platform, Wattpad? Yes, Wattpad. So, in fact, um, apart from working with um, the, the the big Hollywood companies um, in taking uh, U.S. or European IPs uh, into Asia, uh, we also have announced that we're doing a partnership with Wattpad. So, um, in terms of fan fiction novels that already have popularity, and because we're both digital platforms, we're able to see um, what audience in different markets uh, like in terms of storytelling. Mm. And I think this is a kind of a key theme coming through, the whole use of technology to help you better understand customers, particularly if you're trying to do customer acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, with video streamers, customer acquisition and retention is such a key part of the business. Um, PCCW Media is a media company, but it's part of a larger telco. So did you learn anything from being part of the telco customer acquisition playbook that means you now have a playbook for marketing, customer acquisition, retention? Any, any sort of particular techniques or, or strategies that you've used to help accelerate views growth? Yeah, so so we talked a lot about the new normal in the beginning, but there are some old normals that still <laughs> still stays true. So some of those include, you know, having a sustainable business model because, you know, it's not just about the, the, the headline numbers of number of users or just engagement minutes. We have to see, you know, revenue and a path to profitability. Mm -hmm. And in in, in this, right, in, in sort of staying true the, to this old normal, because, you know, you go through phases. I think you see the capital market at one point are rewarding numbers, right? But as I see it, and we've gone through fundraising rounds, external fundraising rounds um, in, uh, in the past two years as well, uh, we do see that investors, um, they're very real. They still look for a path to profitability. And at a minimum, even before you get to profitability, um, it's revenue multiple. So you've got to be generating revenue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the things that we do, you know, mundane things like customer acquisition and retention um, are important mindset, let's say, to have. It is not exactly the same skill set because the new normal on the internet as a streamer versus as a pay TV operator, the biggest difference is 
You can't sign a contract for 24 months with a customer, put it away, and decide to only speak to them three months before their contract is up for renewal. You are acquiring users every day, and you are only rewarded with their loyalty if you continue to be able to get them to engage with the platform. So for us, while we look at the metrics of that, you know, uh, number of monthly active users, we also look at the minutes. Um, are we growing the minutes they consume with us? Because unless they are const unless they are watching, um, they're not going to be loyal to the platform. There is no such thing as a, a, as a term contract. So. It does two things to the business model. One is how do you look at the customer acquisition cost, right? You're not acquiring, your LTV is very different. I can tell you on the pay TV side, the LTV is 21 months, right? Because on average, the contract is at least 21 months. So you know that, and you have a fixed, pretty much a fixed cost. Here, you have to earn your customer loyalty. Um, and so how do we spend that acquisition cost um, wisely. Um, a few things that we do, um, again, has to do with customer analytics. And only until we get to sort of the last year having enough customer data, then we, we can do a lot more accurate um, predictive LTVs. Uh, we can do a lot more attribution analysis. Um, this includes, for example, even when we acquire users, right? So there are a few means we acquire users. Of course, we have great telco partners that we work with around the, the, the region, whether it's the Telcom Cell or Singtel here or AIS in Thailand, um, but we also do a lot of direct D2C um, uh, drive as well. And for that, we um, really look at um, attribution analysis being a successful conversion, a fruitful, productive customer. Where did they come from? Did they come from just a Google search word by um, uh, SEO that we do? Or did it come through a Facebook ad um, and, uh, and or something else, and then they come in and search for us, and then they come through? So we know how to spend our marketing dollars from that point of view. Um, and that is important for us to continually uh, optimize. So if you take that experience as someone who's actually spending your marketing dollars wisely using the digital platforms, you've got 36 million subscribers around the region, um, and you were in ad-supported service, dual stream, but you know you were providing ad-supported from the beginning, you've got a bit of a head start on many of your regional competitors in terms of working with advertisers and advertising agencies. Given you scale, given you working across these platforms, how, have, how has your relationship with the agencies, your relationships with brands um, evolved, and how do you actually work with them to kind of create a value that helps them deliver on the same kind of ROI that you, you do for your own subscribers? Yeah, so the, the, the new normal, the new ecosystem involves, um, as I mentioned, obviously, our viewers at the center of it, but our telco partners on the ad side, ad agencies, the brand themselves are becoming a very important part of the ecosystem because um, they also know a lot because they they also have access to a lot more data now. So they are very uh, return-centric, return on ROI-centric um, in the way they work with us. Um, and ad agencies and DSPs are also an important part of the ecosystem that we work with. Um, it's not one formula, but we do... Um, have multiple layers on how we monetize um, on an advertising model. Um, so for something, let's say, for most of our production, and let's talk about um, um, no signal no FOMO. So um, because it is a adventure reality show, um, we have an insurance company um, that is our title sponsor because their, their um, whole theme is about celebrating life and um, and the, ex the excitement and adventure really suits that well, so we could integrate that to the core um, value of the production. But that is not enough. We also have to include um, other advertisers from whether it's um, um, programmatic, um, working with agencies, and, and really trying to layer the advertising product um, to uh, each title. Mm -hmm. So again, on the, the role of technology, obviously we've seen, particularly in China, particularly some of the US streaming services, the use of data analytics, the use of AI are very, very important. Um, how are you using those kind of technologies? And the second part of the question really is, with the next wave of 5G coming in, how does that affect your business? Mm -hmm. So first of all, um in, in terms of, you know, again, optimizing the, the business and looking at um, 
how do we look at the analytics? Um, we're using not just analytics, but how do we use technology? We we'll use it sort of front of the house and back of the house. The more front of the house, um, I mentioned some of it has to do with that um, uh, predictive LTV on the acquisition side, the attribution analysis, um, and then the back of the house includes something that improves our sorry, improves our own um, efficiency. Uh, for example, we have been using machine learning to ingest video content. So we work with Google in terms of video recognition technology. So in the old days, um, we would have editors doing stunts. Right? If you do stunts, they would go back to the archive and take out everything that's promotable around, let's say, um, Valentine's Day theme or something like that, and they would draw out all the relevant scenes. But with machine learning, um, uh, and, and what we've seen, it's getting more and more accurate. We're able to shorten the time, um, and therefore the frequency, and therefore the output on how many of these stunts we can do. Um, and that also allows us to uh, work with different advertising partners. And we have an example where in the Philippines, we have a toothpaste brand, and they wanted to sponsor a string of content related to kissing scenes because, you know, toothpaste. Right? So we've used that machine learning and we're able to very quickly draw up um, the relevant um, uh, uh, content for them to create a, a tailored product for the particular um, sponsorship needs. Mm -hmm. 5G? 5G. Mm. So for 5G, for for okay, going back to to our home market. Um, so Hong Kong uh, looks like you know we're launching 5G in April, um, as the wider group HKT is doing that. We are looking at uh, new things, right? So what what does 5G really bring in terms of content? Uh, late, uh, lower latency, high resolution. Um, so what can we do with it? Uh, one, there's a lot of. Uh, excitement, I don't want to use the word hype. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about um, AR, VR type of content. I think that will be part of it from a telco customer acquisition marketing drive because that is an important message because they need to be able to say to the users what they are getting in terms of 5G. Right? Just saying it's faster, it's not enough, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, for sure, um, there may not be a whole lot of volume of the AR and VR content. I mean, to be honest, I mean, right now, whether it's 4K or 8K, you've seen only limited set of content, right? But it is, from a telco point of view, an important message to communicate, right, to, to users to get them to understand 5G. Um, but I think often what is overlooked are the more commercial applications of 5G. I think 5G, beyond just a consumer application, whether it's in healthcare, medical, I think there's a lot more impact um, to businesses that will, you know, trickle through um, with that, um, you know, low latency, um, high speed, and high resolution in medical type of um, um, application. And we're also uh, looking at that. All of this is all video based, so it's very relevant to, to what we do. But it may go beyond just the consumer type of um, um, 5G applications. So a new range of services, not mm. just entertainment, but, but right. a wider range of services. So talking of your home market of Hong Kong, um, when we talk about the digital space, and I guess the digital matters component of all the matters, we often talk about a, a, a battle between the incumbents and the traditional players, and then the rising smart young new players. But you actually sit across both. You have the traditional incumbents, the leading pay TV platform, you have a free-to-air business, and yet you have video streaming and music streaming, which are the smart, young technology kind of emerging, emerging businesses. How do you manage both of them? It, it seems a little bit ambidextrous. How do you manage things like hiring people to work across those businesses and creating a culture that doesn't clash? Because many of the traditional businesses may want to transition to that world, but are asking themselves, okay, how do I do that in a way that doesn't destroy what I have and just create something new? So you've managed both of those. How, do you, how have, you, have you gone about that? Uh, well, first of all, I'd be lying if we said we didn't have any challenges or any clashes between these businesses. It's always, it's hard. So I always say Hong Kong is our most complex market because I have to manage a pay TV business, a free TV 
business and an OTT business, right? So to some extent, um, just, again, attracting talent or motivating people, right? The mo we have to mot continually motivate, right, the pay TV team who are really delivering, um, well, of course, the largest revenue and as well as it's, they're, they're, it's, they're running a very profitable business. And we have to continue to reward them because they've done a good job in staying relevant. And the mandate for, for the pay TV is evolve to continually stay relevant. I think that's that job over there to, to continually to get done, right? And it's never really done. <laughs> you have to continue to do it. And then, um, fortunately, for the OTT business, um, Hong Kong is actually only about 10% of the business. Um, for the view business, 90% um, um, is um, outside of Hong Kong, uh, which is a good thing because that's what we set out to do. We saw um, in, in Hong Kong as the pay TV incumbent. Mm -hmm. Actually, we were the incumbent, if you think about it. Yeah, From the very beginning, we were the underdog, right? But again, so that's why I'm personally very paranoid about being complacent because we can, we were the disruptor, we became the market leader, but if you fast forward 15 years later, we're getting challenged. I don't think the challenges that we face in Hong Kong as the pay TV operator is any different to operators here in Singapore, in Thailand, or in Malaysia, right? It is almost the new normal that you have to really evolve and you expect, right, that business at best right now is single digit growth and already that's that's not unchallenging, let's say. Right. But for us as a group, it's really setting our sights on so how do we while we get those challenges in our home market, can we use those challenges to our advantage? And are we gutsy enough to go and venture out to markets that we were not familiar with? Mm -hmm. And that is about recognizing talent, right? And diversity as well. So um, I, we're so blessed that we're able to recruit talent and now we work with a very diverse team and I think local talent is hugely important because you can't be running a service and you can make a service available in 17 market, but you have to run it and you have to, if you want to truly be a service for the market, you have to have people who really understand the local consumers um, and are able to take the pan regional proposition and continue to develop it locally. So being able to attract talent across the region in the local market is important. So stay relevant, uh, keep evolving, and really build up local talent capability have been some of the key, key, way, key things that have supported the current growth. Anything, what's next? What's, what's the next exciting thing that we, we can expect? Because it's been a great track record so far. This is continuing to expand, you keep evolving, but what, what, what do you think's next? Well, uh, you know, we, we started talking about by talking about competitive edge, but what is next is we just have to work hard to even maintain that, right? So we're not, again, complacent that, you know, we've gotten there. Um, I, I believe we're the largest in Asia right now in terms of uh, monthly active users, but, and, and also engagement, it is about, Again, customer loyalty has to be earned, especially in this. You're earning it daily, right? Or at least monthly, even if you're charging monthly plans. So our job is never quite done. Um, it's about um, putting out good content. Um, do we understand what viewers want? Are we producing the right content? And fortunately, with all the three years of data on the 30, 36 million users that we have, we've learned a lot. So we've got to learn to use that data better. Um, and th there's still a lot to be done on that area. Awesome. Please join me in thanking Janice Lee. Thank you. Oops. Thanks, Janice. Yeah. Thank you.